Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon, and you are watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And tonight, we're going again, this will be our third part on the Levitical series here that I'm doing on Levitical Law. Uh, the Law of Moses, as many call it, and how uh, it has a very interesting prophetic insight to it. And of course, sometimes we'll look at just the simplicity of the meaning of some of the verses here. We're on chapter 6, is where we left off last, and so if you have your Bible... Uh, using a King James Bible in this case here. Again, if it's something that we need the Hebrew on, we'll definitely refer to Hebrew, but in this particular chapter here, we can use English. Uh, so let's go with verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered unto him to keep, in other words, you loan something to your neighbor, and he's keeping this for you, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or have deceived his neighbor, or have found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely. In other words, the neighbor lost something, you found it, you kept it, but you didn't give it back. Or you stole it, took it away violently from him, broke into his house. Or if he loaned it to you, and you've been keeping it, and it mysteriously disappears, and etc. Those type scenarios there. Then the scripture says in verse 4, Then it shall be, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, let's finish verse 3, was lost and lieth concerning it, and swear falsely, and any uh, uh, of all these that a man doeth, sinning therein, then it shall be because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing... Um, which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost thing which he found, or all that about, excuse me, or all that about which he hath sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in, a, in the principle, and shall add the fifth part more thereto, and give it unto him to whom it, it uh, appertaineth or pertaineth to in the day of his trespass offering. All right. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish, out of the flock, with the estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. Now, the first point I just really wanted to bring out about this particular passage here is that before you can actually go before the Lord, and take your sacrifice. In this case here, before you can even go before the Lord and be and have your sacrifice, Yeshua, before He will even accept your sacrifice for for what for this particular type of sin, you have to first make restitution. Then you bring your sacrifice. So, in other words, if you took and you stole something from someone, you have to restore it back. If you don't have the original item, then you have to go buy them one. Uh, or whatever it takes in order to make that restitution, as well as even a fifth more back. Let's say you stole $100. Then you would restore back the $100 plus 25 more, then go repent before the Lord. I just thought the, the interesting part is the fact that God requires you before He accepts your sacrifice is restitution. And believe me, I've known people in life that have went a long way in making restitution. And of course, there's some things I'm sure in, in some situations in life, it, it, maybe it's just not possible to make it. Uh, I, I myself, when I was young, when I was 16 years old, I had done just such a thing. I had taken something from someone and I held on to it for 20 years years nearly. Maybe, maybe I'll take that back, not 20 years. Had to have been about 10 years. Had to have been about 10 years. And um, the odd thing was, though, as I became a Christian after this all happened, and, uh, you know, I give my life to the Lord earlier in life, naturally, but, you know, went wayward as a teenager and stuff, you know, and because I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But 10 years, at least 10 years went by, maybe more, and I still had that item that I had taken, and it just never would leave me. Well, I came to the point in my mind that how could I ever take it back? I don't even know where the man would live, how to contact him or anything. I was only 16, or maybe 15 actually at the time. I wasn't even 16 as of yet. And um, 
But the Lord kept putting it on my heart because I was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost to go and make that thing that I'd done wrong right. And he just wouldn't let me rest. And I kept saying, Lord, but I don't even know how to get in touch with this man. Well, one day I took the time. In fact, it was a long way to where I had to go to take it back as well. It wasn't anywhere near where I lived. I had to spend some time, some hours traveling to get there. But I put that thing in my car and I went back and I went looking for this man. And lo and behold, I went back to where I thought he might live at. Of course, everything had changed by then. All the, the scenery, everything had all been changed. Things had been built. Places had been torn down. Where he lived was gone. And, but I asked someone if they knew who he was. His name was Mike. And they said, yes, he lives up on the hill. I went there and knocked on the door, and sure enough, he was home. That was even more odd. And of course, he'd gotten much older by then. He was an old man. And I went in. He was so happy to see me. And he had, because he was a Christian at the time. It was actually, he was a great influence in my life as a teenager, but I had done evil. And I never will forget when I pulled it out and laid it on the table and told him that I needed to make something right, something I had done to him. And the tears just came down his face. And he handed it back to me. He says, you can have it. And I said, I can't do that. And he just started weeping. He threw his arms around me and he says, I understand. I understand why. And so I made the restitution for what I knew at that time. And in return, God filled me with the Holy Spirit. It's interesting how God works. And then after that, I left. I never seen him again. In fact, it wasn't long after that when I tried to go back to where he was, he was no longer there. But it's just kind of odd how God kept that man in that one place all those years waiting for me to go and make that one thing I'd done wrong in life like that right. And so I just, I found that fascinating. I just thought I'd share that with you. I don't know why, but I just thought I'd share that with you. Anyway, let's, let's drop on down. Uh, we go, we're, we're going into the burnt offerings and things of this nature through chapter 6. But when you get down to chapter, excuse me, verse 24 in chapter 6, this is where it gets prophetic. It says here, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering in the place where the burnt offering is killed. Shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord? It is most holy. The priest that offereth for sin shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy. And when there is sprinkled of the blood up, uh, thereon upon any garment, that sh thou shalt wash that where, uh, whereon it was sprinkled in the holy place. But the earthen vessel wherein it is sodden or boiled, shall be broken, and if it be sodden in a brazen pot, it shall be both scorched and rinsed in water. All the males among the priests shall eat thereof. It is most holy. Do you realize that this passage right here is prophetic? Do you know that God was showing the priest the service of communion. He was actually demonstrating to them there that this sacrifice that is holy must be eaten. And Christ was the sacrifice. He said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But he didn't explain himself at first. The priests all walked around and said, this, this man's crazy. But God had given them a law to know that when the sacrifice of the sin offering is offered, 
that the priest, Aaron and his sons, are to eat it. Christ took the bread and he broke the bread that day and he said, this is my body. Eat it in remembrance of me. The bread represented his body. They were eating it, showing that they were the priestly sons. Even though they weren't from maybe the Levitical tribe, they were keeping the commandment that God had gave Moses when the priests were failing to keep it. The other thing that was beautiful was verse 28. Notice what it says here. But, <clears throat> but the earthen vessel where, wherein it is boiled or sodden shall be broken. Christ, that sacrifice, the Messiah, Mashiach, God of Israel, was in an earthen vessel. His body was that earthen vessel and his body was broken. This is why God commanded that if it is boiled, the meat, in other words, the sacrifice that is offered that's going to be prepared, that must be prepared, cooked, and eaten, if it is boiled in an earthen vessel, like a clay jar, in other words. See, we, we are from the dust of the earth. God formed Adam from the clay. And Christ, when he came to the earth, he became from the dust of the earth. Why? Because the food you eat and stuff is still coming from the dust of the earth. So it makes up the physical body. And his physical body would be broken on Calvary. And so therefore, another type that God gave to the children of Israel, to my Levitical brethren, God was giving us a sign to know that one, we were, there would be a communion, that we, we would kill that sacrifice, we would eat that sacrifice. And if that sacrifice was prepared in an earthen vessel, that vessel would be broken. We should look for the sacrifice because he would be in a broken vessel. And we were the ones to break the vessel. It was the Levites. Mm. But if not, I am just so blessed to see that Christ was the earthen vessel that was broken. And it was the priest that would break his body. And they were required to eat it. It was a sign to Israel that he was our sacrifice. He is my sacrifice. And I have accepted him fully and partake of his body. And I know it's not the literal body. I don't believe like Catholicism does on that. They, they got their pride to believe what they want, but it's, a, it's just a token to us. It is, it, is, it is a sign to us that it represented his body. And, and easily, God accepts a meal offering as a sacrifice as well. So therefore, when you're taking in the communion bread, an unleavened bread prepared according to biblical mandate, the flour. See, sometimes it's to be mingled with oil, sometimes it is not, depending on the offering that was to be offered. Then you are then taking in as the sacrifice that God accepted and which we accept to be as a representation of the body of Christ. And we are here at Passover season. So I trust it's a blessing for you and uh, we'll be looking into Passover messages as we get into this season. Shalom. And again, God bless. Baruch Hashem.